Hello and welcome to my channel, The Way What Is True. Remember to like and subscribe and to comment down below. Now this video is all about uh, how Christ did not die for our sins for all of us to be miserable. That does not mean that life is always going to be a bed of roses because it won't be. In fact, life oftentimes can be unbearable. But yeah, uh, the first thing I'd like to get out of the way is this. We all have thoughts, we all have feelings and we all have emotions. But who we are on inside of us is not our thoughts, feelings or emotions, okay? So we have these thoughts that are, that are uh, bombarding our hearts and minds. Now, I would just like you to try and do something. Just go for 30 seconds without having any thoughts at all. You'll probably find it impossible, right? That's what I meant when I said that our thoughts that we are having continually in our minds are not who we are. So we have to separate ourselves from our thoughts, take a big step back from it all and think to ourselves, hmm, this isn't me. We should not be slaves to our negative thoughts, feelings and emotions, and especially to things like anxiety and to depression as well. It's, you know, uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear and we should never listen to the, to the lies of the enemy. Now, it's very easy to tell if Satan is lying to us because all we have to do is do a comparison test. Whatever thoughts, feelings and emotions and whatever negative self-talk that's going on in our minds, because the battleground where spiritual warfare happens is in here. So if it's not lining up with what's written in the Bible, then we know it's from the devil or just from us, you know. Anyway, um, as I was at church last Sunday, this uh, lady who I know gave me this Christian magazine, okay? And it's got some interesting articles in it. And it's all about enjoying everyday life, being free from negative thoughts, feelings and emotions and from things like anxiety, depression and how God has a purpose for all of us, okay? So uh, I've just marked out a few small pieces of it here and there. I'm not going to read the whole magazine because it will just be too lengthy, the video, if, if I did that. But there's some interesting things in here which I'm going to read out of, okay? So it starts off like this, straight from the heart. Friends, John 10.10 10 is a scripture that means so much to me personally. Jesus says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Now reflect on this, okay? Now she goes on to write this. I'm not going to give you the name of this person because it's not really relevant to the video, okay? But she is a well-known Christian lady who's a celebrity. Um, there was a time when I honestly didn't know how to enjoy my life and battling anxiety was one of the reasons why. I often say I was a professional worrier I was good at it. I worried about my children. I worried about our bills and I, wor and I worried about what would happen in the future. Now, oftentimes we find ourselves worrying where it's about financial problems, family problems, relationship problems, financial problems, loneliness, depression. You get the idea. It just goes on and on and on. And one of the most common things we worry about is the future. But God has seen it all anyway. So why should we worry about things like God has seen coming and, and he knows what's going to happen, okay? We just have to trust in him. Then it goes on to say this. Thankfully, over time, the Lord helped me to find victory and live from a place of peace instead of always feeling anxious. The more I dove deep into God's word and did what it says, the more freedom I found. Every time I would open my Bible, Jesus met me there in a beautiful way. See, God communicates to all of us Christians through what's written in the Bible, Right? 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I've learned that God wants to take our worries, cares and concerns and he wants to give us his peace and joy in return. I think that's a pretty good trade, okay? Now, just reflect on this. He knows we have problems. He knows we have worries, fears, anxieties. He knows life is tough. Look at how tough his life was. When he was on earth, okay? If, if you personally don't know all that much about the life of Jesus Christ, then I strongly suggest that you read it up for yourself. It's all in the Bible, <laughs> okay? He was mocked, he was ridiculed, he was spat upon, you know? And the last hours, the last few days of his life was horrific, you know? Anyway, um, the next page goes on to say this. 
Anxiety comes in many forms and you've probably felt it before, whether it's pressure at work, a struggling relationship, past trauma or uncertainties about the future. The simplest way I know to define anxiety is to say that it means spending today trying to figure out tomorrow. Okay, It's an uneasy feeling of worry, dread or fear. And in all honesty, anxiety has a lot to do with our mind. Remember what I said earlier on about how our thoughts are not really who we are? We should separate ourselves from our thoughts, okay? When stressful situations pop up and we worry, we allow our thoughts to rotate around and around the same situation, playing out the potential outcomes. While most of the terrible scenarios we imagine don't actually come to pass, the fear can cause us to feel miserable. However, that's not how God desires for us to live. Jesus teaches us to take life one day at a time and not to worry about anything because each day has all that we can handle. So in other words, God knows we have problems. God knows life is going to be a struggle a lot of the time, but he wants us to take it one day at a time instead of fretting and worrying about the future. It's a very similar... Uh, I, I would draw comparisons between this and boasting about tomorrow as well. We should never boast as Christians or as anybody because we don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. In fact, none of us know if we're going to see the morning. Okay, so we should never boast about anything and neither should we worry about anything either. Okay, uh, so it says here, Matthew six twenty five to 34. In order not to worry and be anxious, we must learn new ways, God's ways, to handle our problems and challenges. This also includes new ways to think. When we are tempted to worry about the future, it's time to remember what God has done in the past. We should remember past victories. Psalm 77 11 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I, I will remember your miracles of long ago. Okay, so I'm going to skip this. Oh yeah, there's a few more Bible passages that are that are useful. So 1 John 4, 9, 10. God loves me. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who love God who, who, who love God and are called according to his purpose. And Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. God, I trust you. And Psalm 34, 8. God is good. We should never ever forget these things. Uh, also, read Psalm 23, the Psalm of David. Yeah, that's very useful. Right, and there's an interesting article here which talks about when well, it's called You Are Welcome at God's Table. There's a beautiful story in 2 Samuel chapter 9 that illustrates the kind of relationship God wants to have with us. After the death of King Saul and his son Jonathan, David began to search for someone in their bloodline. Jonathan had been like a brother to David and he wanted to honour his friend by showing favour to any of his descendants. David asked, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? 2 Samuel 9, 3. Then it goes on to say, David found out that Jonathan had a son named, now forgive me, I really don't know how to pronounce this, Mephibosheth, it's M-E-P-H-I-B-O-S-S-H-E-T-H, -S -S okay, so I really don't know how to pronounce it, <laughs> forgive me, who was still alive, but he was told the young man was lame in both feet. However, his condition didn't phase David, who sent for, I think it's Mephosabeth. Mephosabeth. Forgive me if I'm wrong. Anyway, however, his condition didn't phase David, who sent for Mephosabeth to be brought to him. Mephosabeth came in fear and shame, bowing and asking, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? 2 Samuel 9 8. Okay. David assured Mephosabeth, saying, Do not fear. Meth Meth it's, it's difficult to pronounce, you know, like, unless you're familiar with reading this. Uh, I'm just going to stick with Methosabeth, I think. <laughs> David assured, wow, <laughs> it's, it's a name that a lot of people struggle to say, saying, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, 
your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Second Samuel 9, 7. I love this story so much because David had a covenant relationship with Saul's son, Jonathan. A covenant relationship means so much more in the Bible than we understand today. When you're in a covenant relationship with somebody, everything that you have is available to them and everything they have is available to you. We have this very same covenant relationship with God through Jesus. Like King David looked for Saul's descendants, God is looking for you. I want to show you kindness. Sometimes we are like, it's that name again, <laughs> Mephbosheth. <laughs> We see the areas of our lives in which we are weak and we begin to think they keep us from all God has promised us. However, God is saying to you what David said to you know who. He's saying, don't be afraid. Don't live in fear over your m mistakes or your flaws. I will show you kindness for Jesus' sake. I want to be good to you, not because you deserve it or have earned it, but because of what Jesus did on your behalf. This is what it means to be in Christ okay we need to realize our powerlessness and our helplessness it takes a lot of humility because human beings are creatures of pride and we need to realize we have a place at God's table none of us are perfect we're all flawed in various ways we may be brilliant in some ways but flawed in others um there's another story here about a guy called Randy Johnson you know uh yeah, so I think I'll read some of this story. I won't read all of it, but uh, yeah. Randy Johnson has been growing in his faith for about six years, and the year was 1999, by the way. Now happily married, attending church and doing life with Jesus, things were better than they'd ever been. Randy owned his own business, raced cars with his closest friends, and had found freedom from multiple addictions. He had a beautiful family and had even started to heal from some of his deepest wounds, but still, there was something missing. Deep in his heart, Randy knew that there had to be more to life with Christ. He had a passion and desire to help others in some way. But every time he was offered an opportunity to serve, he would keep thinking, I want to, but I can't. Now, this is something that a lot of people can relate to. So definitely keep listening to this. It was as if this record kept repeating in his head. Randy, you don't know enough about the Bible. You're not smart enough to do that. You're terrified to get up in front of people and to speak. So you can't do that. I want to, but I can't. I want to, but I'm not talented enough. I don't have the gifts that are necessary, right? Yet despite all the books that he felt disqualified him, Randy still had a longing to do something. One night while he was at church, the desire became so overwhelming that he prayed in desperation, here I am, God. If you can use me, use me. There were no fireworks after he prayed this prayer, no audible voice from heaven, no angelic visitation, no epiphany. But he got up and started watching for God to show him exactly what to do. Three weeks later, Randy was getting ready for work one morning and flipped on the news, covering massive damage from a tornado in Oklahoma. The devastation was so intense that he tried to change the channel, but he just kept finding more footage of the same story. His heart was moved with compassion. It was then that God whispered to Randy, you can help those people. Meanwhile, Randy kept wondering how in the world it would happen and saying to himself, they're halfway across the country. Anything I could do would be so minimal that it wouldn't matter. I want to help them, but... At the end of the second day, Randy sat behind the sales counter of his equipment sales business in Danville, Virginia, looking out at their inventory, several brand new trailers, and started praying again. Okay, Lord, here's what we'll do. We'll take that 20-foot trailer out there. Somehow, some way, we'll get it filled up with product supplies, and me, Terry, and the kids will take that to Oklahoma. Neither Randy nor his wife, Terry, knew just how much God was going to multiply their yes in the next few hours. After making a few calls to friends, local businesses and churches, they found themselves in a Kmart parking lot with more than enough drivers and donations to not only bring their 20-foot trailer, but two more 48-foot trailers to serve Oklahoma City. They ended up helping over 500 families on that first trip. 
and it ignited in Randy and Terry a lifelong passion to help with disaster relief. You see how these things can happen? Yeah. And there's a page here saying there's no greater feeling than knowing you have stepped out to do all that God has placed in your heart. To share the gospel, help someone who is hurting and change a life. See, often when we're feeling down, when we're troubled, when we have life problems, whatever they may be, when we go out of our way to help other people, it makes us feel better. And, you know, when we work for God, God starts working for us, in other words, yeah? And there's another interesting page called Who Can I Trust? The short answer to that is nobody, even family can let us down, even our own parents can potentially let us down. That doesn't mean to say that we have to be paranoid or anything or, or to live in fear, but ultimately we can only trust God and we need to leave everything with him. It's as simple as that. <laughs> I'm not even going to read that page. Um, yeah, we can only trust God, you know, anyone and everyone can let us down. But yeah, so there's another interesting article here that I'm just going to read. I do like this magazine that Al's given. So, yeah. Um, it says here, if I wasn't a preacher, I think I would have probably enjoyed being either a detective or a psychologist because of how much I love to try and figure things out. Oftentimes, when I get home from teaching a conference, I will give my mind a little rest by watching a mystery or reading some Christian fiction. I don't like gore and gross stuff, but I love getting lost in a good, clean mystery movie or book. I like Murdoch mysteries, and I've watched all of the Monk series twice. My favourite stories are the ones that hold my attention and keep me guessing how things are going to work out. I think our walk with God can be a bit of a mystery sometimes too. There are twists and turns, a lot of surprises, and quite a bit of excitement to capture our attention. We never really know for sure what God is going to do or when, and a lot of times we don't understand what he's doing when we see it. That's very, very true. Often when we pray, he answers our prayers and we don't even know it. Sometimes we figure out he's answered our prayers months, weeks, years later or whatever, but not at the time, which is very, very interesting. And sometimes he doesn't answer our prayers because we're praying about the wrong things. Let's not forget that. We need to pray in alignment with his will, otherwise he won't listen. Or, or he'll listen, but he simply won't do anything. <laughs> you know, but we can't pray about things that are contrary to his will. Um, we, yeah, so it goes on to say, we never really know for sure what God is going to do or when. And a lot of times we don't understand what he's doing when we see it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So to be honest, I don't think we would enjoy our lives if we knew everything that was going to happen anyway. Yes, life would be very boring if we knew what was going to happen and when. I used to have a hard time not trying to solve the problems in my life. However, over time, I saw how reasoning just causes confusion and God simply wants us to trust him. How often do we get stressed, worked up? We work ourselves up into knots about people, situations, all sorts of things. Okay. With me, I've struggled with loneliness and a lack of friends and only one six-month relationship at the age of 34. With you, it may be something completely different. But yeah, I've often tied myself up in knots thinking, oh, I wonder what that person thinks to me. I wonder if that person's going on my YouTube channel. I wonder what's going on. I wonder if anyone cares. Yeah, God cares. He's the only one we should be focused on. <laughs> Not anybody else. Everything else is a distraction from Satan. The moment you start to get thoughts about people, especially when they're not your family, and they're not really people that you know all that well, and you start second guessing and thinking, oh, you know, uh, I wonder what that person's doing. I wonder if that person secretly thinks about me. Forget about all that. It's rubbish. It's nonsense. Anyway, um, it's possible to get to even deceive ourselves. We can live in a state of self deception, and oftentimes, as, as human beings, unfortunately, tell ourselves what we want to hear. We can't trust what we think a lot of the time. So that's something else to bear in mind as well. But, but you know that old saying that even a broken clock is right twice a day. Sometimes we get things right, but even when we get things right, sometimes we're not as right as what we ought to be. You know, God knows everything. So let's just bear this in mind. And then it goes on to say this. God usually gives us one step at a time. He waits for us to take that step and then he gives us another one like a good mystery. He keeps us motivated and moving forward to see how things will all come together. When I look back on my life and how my story started, all the pain and abuse I experienced and where I am today, I'm totally amazed. 
I never in my wildest imagination would have thought I'd be doing what I'm doing today. I guess if this were who done it, I would have never guessed that I would be one who God would use, but our God can do all things. Now, because I don't want to make this video too long, um, I'm just going to read this part here. Here we are. Now, this is just a quick reminder not to let Satan steal whatever happiness and joy and peace that we have in life, right? So everyday joy. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief, meaning Satan, comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows, right? Jesus did not die on the cross for us to be miserable. He died so we can be delivered from every kind of sadness, oppression and misery. He wants us to have joy. What is joy? Joy is defined in part as great pleasure or happiness, a source or object of pleasure or satisfaction. That's not to be mistaken with lust, because often when people pursue pleasure in the lustful, fleshly fashion, then they are achieving a temporary physical pleasure, but it doesn't result in long-term pleasure, certainly not in the spiritual sense, yeah? So we shouldn't mix those two up. Uh, so what is joy? A joy is defined in part as great pleasure or happiness, a source or object of pleasure or satisfaction, and to derive pleasure from or relish. Joy can cover a range of emotions and include everything from a calm delight to extreme hilarity. Now, in times of extreme hilarity are really fun. Sorry, it says, now, times of extreme hilarity are really fun, and we all need them. Yes, we all need to laugh sometimes, yeah? It's healthy to have moments when we laugh so hard that our sides hurt. God has given, given us an ability to laugh, so there must be a reason why. However, I think to live in a state of calm delight may be even greater. God desires for us to live with his peace and joy at all times. He wants us to enjoy ourselves while we work, while we feed the kids, while we do the dishes, and even while we brush our teeth in the morning, or whenever it is you decide to brush your teeth. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, joy is a gift from God to his children. The world can't give it to you. Now, this is crucial. Nothing in this world, money, cars, holidays, clothing, houses, homes, no, nothing we can buy with money, nothing that we own can give us any kind of happiness, yeah? The world can't give it to you. This is crucial. As I mentioned, we can search for happiness in a lot of things, a lot of places. We can look f to things like relationships, money, vacations, like what I said earlier, houses, clothes, and even open doors of opportunity, careers and jobs and all the rest of it, yeah? Yeah, while these things can bring a degree of excitement for a period of time, happiness is based on what is happening in the moment. However, only one thing can give us true joy and satisfaction, and that's God, yeah? And then it goes on to say, I love Psalm 1611. It says, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The Lord desires for us to live with his joy, to be permanently, consistently satisfied. This all comes from spending quality time with him, reading and studying his word, talking to him in prayer, or simply sitting quietly in his presence. The truth is everything we need to live a joyful life is waiting for us in his presence. The choice is up to us. There's a reason why so many people try and fill the void that's on the side of them with money, cars, sex, relationships, promiscuity, hedonism, food, drink, drugs. It's endless, okay? There's so many millions upon millions of people out there that are trying to fill a void that only God can fill. Isaiah 40, 29, 31. Yeah, it says, He gives power to the faint and weary, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him, shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not become faint or become tired. Okay, so I believe I'll end the video here. Okay, just a couple of more Bible passages, perhaps, because something's caught my eye. <laughs> so, 
So, yeah, we have to believe that God is working and to expect good things. He doesn't want us Christians to have a negative attitude. Sometimes life can get, uh, can get monotonous. We can stagnate in life. Uh, often we can go through phases in life where we aren't growing, we aren't being productive, or we're in a bad situation of some kind, okay? But it says here, God knows everything from the beginning to the end. See Isaiah 46, 9 to 10. He is in control and he can bring it to pass. So let's never underestimate the power of God. Okay, so we shouldn't have a passive attitude or have an attitude of say sera, sera, what will be, will be. You know, that's a worldly attitude that God does not want us to have. It's quite, it's quite negative when you think about it. Now, David said in Psalm 27, 13, I would have despaired had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Because when you think about it, what real purpose does life have without God? What reason do we have to behave and, and to be moralistic as human beings if God doesn't exist? Because if there's no God, there's no judgment, there's no divine judgment. Yeah, sure, you might get put in prison if you get caught for doing something bad. You may go to court, your friends and family may reject you. But ultimately, when you think about it, when we do bad things, ultimately we have to be judged by God. Yeah, okay, there's a justice system set up in place on, on this earth. It's not a perfect justice system. But thank God that it's there, thank God that we have the police. But what real reason do any of us have to behave properly if there's no divine judgment for what we do? Because no matter what we do, no matter how horrific it is, all those people that we did it to are going to die. They're not going to remember. Their children's children are going to forget about what happened in the past. It's going to just fizzle to nothing, whether it's murder, rape. That might sound a bit extreme, what I'm saying, but when you really think about it, the only real reason why any of us have to behave properly is God. That doesn't mean to say I'm one of those people that would just go crazy if I didn't believe God exists, because I'm not like that. <laughs> I'm just saying these are the facts, okay? It's up to you what you think to them. A lot of secular types and a lot of, uh, a lot of humanist types believe in righteousness and goodness uh, without they're needing to be a god or the whole concept of god which oftentimes is quite alien to them they just don't want anything to do with it they don't want anything to do with the bible but yeah i mean ultimately we don't have any reason to behave properly unless there's divine judgment set in place okay because who cares about what other people think to us those people their opinions their judgments these courts of law these police uh they're gonna die and rot in the ground like everybody else, you know what I mean? So, God is the only thing that makes sense in this world, right? All this self-righteousness of these humanists and secular people, don't pay any attention to that. There's no happiness in this secular and uh, humanistic reasoning, okay? There's a veneer, like a superficial, shallow veneer of righteousness, of self-righteousness. That's what it is. Now, a lot of Christians, unfortunately, are guilty of being self-righteous too. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about these atheistic, secular types who believe in the inherent goodness and our ability to be good and to abide by the law and to be good to one another, to be charitable, to be hospitable, to be respectful, to be loving, to be forgiving. That's all well and good. But without God, ultimately, in the big scheme of things, it counts for nothing. So... I hope and pray that you're all well. I hope you've enjoyed this video and watched it all the way through to the end. So remember, God does not want us to be miserable. He wants us to have peace, joy and happiness. And we can only get it through him, Jesus Christ. Bye-bye and take care.